Welcome to the Tricord Advisors podcast, where we answer life's hard questions to help you make smart decisions with your money. I'm Jeremiah Lee, and this is Randy Barkley. We're both certified financial planners. I'm also a California licensed attorney. Welcome back. We've been talking about the, the Silicon Valley Bank and all the issues that happened this last week. And we're going to continue our conversation. We talked in the last section kind of what, what happened, kind of the nuts and bolts. And now we're going to look at, you know, how does this connect to anything else, either other banks currently in, in history where we've been? I mean, kind of what folks should do. Yeah, I mean, there's a historical reference here. Glass-Siegel Act was passed in the 30s, and that's when banks uh, could take their deposits and invest in the stock market and invest in whatever they wanted. And that's when there was a huge failure during the Depression. And there was there was a bank moratorium. Banks actually closed down. And when they reopened, some banks didn't. Their deposits were gone. And the banks that reopened uh, were secure. They were under very strict requirements. They had to act like banks. They had to buy treasuries. They had to do only mm-hmm. loans. They could not do speculative investments per se. Yeah. And uh, that remained until the late 90s, uh, right? And, and then there was and, a law change. And to some extent, banks got boring, right? And, and wonderfully so. <laughs> wonderfully right? so, yeah, right? I think there's there's folks who view a bank as, like we said in an earlier episode, almost like a vault, <laughs> you know, like a Scrooge McDuck type thing. You put your money in there and it just locks in. Well, the reality is kind of like It's a Wonderful Life, the, the movie back you know, for Jimmy Stewart, where they, they actually make loans to people. And that's how banks operate. That's how they make the money to pay you interest. And, you know, after you kind of have the depression forward, banks, in, in the boring aspect being they're buying treasuries, they're making more long-term mortgages, they're doing safe and sane things. But as we become more current, I think people were wanting, desiring higher interest rates. And we seem to go through periods of time. For example, going back, um, you know, banks were prohibited from doing investments other than just normal banking and treasuries. And all of a sudden now, they are they are attracting what I consider speculative money, not necessarily in their deposits, but they're trying to play the game and trying to attract this money. And what happened in Silicon Valley, also in the Signature Bank, is they were paying more interest and they were not using the facilities that were available to them mm. to spread that risk uh, amongst all the registry to secure their depositors because they wanted to pay a little bit more interest. Well, I think we're in an interesting world, you know, just compared to what we were, you know, historically. But uh, we talked about this a little internally. Of we're in a world in which you can not just look at the three banks in your city and say who's paying the most, or right. you have to physically walk down to them. I mean, I, I can go online and check hundreds, if not thousands of banks right. instantly and say who's paying 0. 0.0 more than you know, 0. 0.01 more than the other guy. And I, I, I think in that in that world of that environment, there's an ability to pay a little more, take on a little more risk, and then you're rewarded for it. Your know, money flows into your bank. And then, oh, I cut it by you know half a percent, money flows out of the bank. And in that environment, there's a lot of motivation, I would say, for a bank to attract those deposits. And again, you're looking to bankers. I always call them to be, they need to be the parent in the room. Mm. They need to be the ones that says, that stand up and say, no, you've borrowed too much. You have too much. We have a certain amount of equity. We have a certain amount of income. This is what you should be on your loan to value ratios. The the banker should be the parent in mm. the room. And often they're in sales, right? They're, right. they're trying to attract people. They're trying to negotiate loans. Yeah, that's a hard moment, right? right. What, what role the bank holds in society? Because if if they really hold the, I'm the parent in the room, I'm sorry, you can't have a loan. I'm sorry, you can't have a credit card. Um, that That's useful to society on one side. On another side to say, no, no, we will work with you. We will get over this hump. We will take on this risk. Um, you know, passes that risk down to the bank. But then ultimately what we're seeing here is it passes it to taxpayers. Right. If the government's going to step in and save guarantee. people, yeah, guarantee these amounts and save banks or individuals who maybe didn't make the best choice. And again, this goes back historically. I remember American savings loans back in the early 80s. Mm. And when that savings loan blew up, well, again, they were not under the FDIC, but yet the the loss was so severe and the political fallout was so bad that the government says, okay, we're going to take all savings loans. And we brought them under the FDIC Mm. umbrella. And there's a lot of discussion about that, whether that was a smart thing to do or not. Those depositors, they were getting more interest. Therefore, they were taking on more risk and they should have taken more, right. more, they should have been able to say, okay, I'm not going to do this. Yeah. But nobody was at the gate saying, this money above this is going to be at yeah. some risk to you. Yeah. It's funny with my kind of attorney background, it, it, it reminds me of like getting on a uh, amusement park ride at a, at a, <laughs> um, a, a small Ferris, right. uh, Ferris wheel type thing. You know, they have you sign that waiver that says, I acknowledge that this is likely to kill me. I waive all risk. Or even like a parking structure, right? You right. go in there, you have to have that little ticket that says, 
Uh, it's an exculpation clause that, that you acknowledge all the risk. And th there's part of that that is really helpful, right? That, that, that you understand what I'm doing has some risk to it. Now I'm an adult. I'm choosing it. I'm picking to do this risk and I'm going to walk forward knowing it. I'm fully responsible for whatever happens. Right. On the flip side, that's become so common in the legalese sense. Um, you know, everyone goes to Disneyland, kind of goes wherever. You, know, you click the box, say yes. Uh, do you, you know, agree to the terms on your computer software? Yep. It just, yes, yes. Get out of my way. Um, same thing I would imagine here is that someone walking into a bank, I would imagine the majority of folks out there don't under, who, in, even in Silicon Valley Bank, these are mostly sophisticated folks, did not understand the risk they were taking on or potentially taking on. Right. And nor did they want to do some due diligence to find out. They probably just said, well, take my money, give me the interest moving right. forward. Right. And a uh, society, it, you know, it, it's hard to say, well, they, they should have known. You know, well, I, again, every, everything is good until it's not. Right. And then we've been kind of waiting. You know, we've been having a lot of discussion in our office about event that will change. In other words, what will be that key event? Yeah. We didn't really know what that was. Now, this may be the event that we'll start to see yeah. we're heading towards the bottom. That, that shoves the markets, right? That We've seen a lot of concern right. that the market has probably another leg to go down, the general right. stock market, right. another leg to go down. And this may be the shove it needs to get down there and then finally reset. Or this might just be another item or issue that's going on. It, it's yeah, I mean, I, I met with a client yesterday and it was a relatively new client. They came in the latter part, about the middle of last year. And they were surprised that their account value was only down like 1.9%. And they said, how did you do that? And I said, well, if you look at your holdings, we put the vast majority of your money in what we call bill. It is a zero to three month treasuries. Mm -hmm. And they have responded extremely protective. They're paying about a 4% interest rate. But because of the short duration, if you listen to our first segment of this program, the short durations are a lot less volatile. In fact, in some cases, there's zero volatility in them. But we put the vast majority of the money in their holdings. And I said, we want to stay there until yeah. we get a clear direction that equities now become the next thing that we yeah. want to invest in. This may be even a good comment, a big, big moment just to make the comment of the overarching idea. Like there are so many people that we work with that started their 401k when they were in their 30s. Right. And they never changed it. They just put the money in. And, and for some people, if they, if they pick the right thing and they're in their 30s, that's a great. Just keep right. contributing. Don't even think about it. But there are so many folks I'll see that we get into their 401k or their savings or whatever, that when they first created it, they might have made a good choice, right. but they haven't monitored it or stayed up with it. Similar to right now, like right now, you know, a lot of our stuff is in short term uh, bill, like treasury bills. And that's a great thing at the moment. If interest rates start coming back down, that's a horrible thing to be in. It, it's not going to be the right place to be. And that's part of, I think, you know, not day trading in the sense of jump in, jump out, you know, trying to make a quick buck, but just prudent management to say, okay, for this season, this is kind of the best place for us to be. And we we work really hard not to predict, you know, what's coming next, but we try and respond to where we see ourselves in the market cycle or in the business cycle to say, okay, if we're having increasing interest rates, these types of assets will respond better and currently right. short term, you know, treasury type things. At some point, that's going to shift. And then we're going to move our portfolios into things that we think will be the best for the next season. Yeah, I mean, we have clients that have well above the $250,000 uh, deposit protection. And um, for those clients, we give them alternatives. Now, obviously, leaving money in the bank is has got purposeful, but we're not going in and examining every bank. We just want to look at, okay, these limits, what's reasonable the amount of money yeah. that you keep in a bank? You know, people are using that for lines of credit or other yeah. kinds of credit or whatever. That's perfectly fine. But for investors, we want to make sure that that money is invested in such a way that it's not subject to these these drawdowns, what I call these long dated bonds, because th those are the ones that get. And our investors, if we do have some long dated bonds, we've told them, just wait, don't worry about yeah. it. You're still getting the interest yeah. and don't panic. That's a really good comment that there's this huge value and purpose for long dated bonds. Right. It's just not a bank who might have to give out the money to them. Yeah. It's for someone who says, oh, I can hold this for 20 years. I can hold this for 10 years and, and watch it grow. And that's a great moment for them. It, it, it I'm amazed with this industry, how you know people talk about the market as if it's one market or right. the banks as if it's one system. But really, you know, this, this gets very unique to every single kind of individual and what they what what makes sense for their life, right. what makes sense for their portfolio and their situation, and then to to craft something that makes sense for them, and and it, it's not the same for everyone, you right. know? And and to say there's a prudent path forward to help them accomplish their goals, and, and that, that's what we do. That's what I enjoy doing. Uh, but it, it's interesting in this moment, you know, when we first saw Silicon Valley Bank 
you know, I had a concern, you know, do we have any connection? And we don't, you know, a lot of people don't, uh, but to say, where are we connected? What right. banks do we use? What, what custodians do we and use? And we've had, we've had calls from clients to saying, are, you know, it, it, you know, are we, are we in trouble? Do we, do we have interest in banks? They don't know exactly what their, their portfolio is. And we've looked at it and said, we have vir- virtually zero exposure to banks. So that's not the issue at all. We have, we have great exposure to a wide base of, of companies yeah, and even and financial equities. industry, like right. we're invested in the financial industry. And, and that's, you know, taking a beating this week. Right. Um, but it'll be interesting to see as this unwinds. Uh, it, will, it will heal. I, yeah. I can promise you that yeah. over time. And, and what, how much, like you said initially, will this be a kick that changes the markets or will this just be a blip? But we'll see in the coming weeks and we will right. respond just like everyone else will respond. But um, it's an interesting moment we find ourselves. Right. For sure. Yeah. If you miss any part of this episode, you can find us online. You can go to uh, Tricord Advisors Podcast or Retirement Unlimited on YouTube, or you can go to our website, which is retirementunlimited.com. Until next week, folks, may you grow in wisdom and knowledge. Thank you for listening.